said, my name is Kim McLean and I am part of the global expert team here at Emerson EMP Software and my focus is on formation evaluation and uh, petrophysics. And today what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through a workflow that our geoscience services group did for one of our clients. It's an integrated petrophysical interpretation to help unlock unconventional reservoirs. So in a moment, I'll talk a little bit about what the challenge was and, and uh, what we were helping them uh, try and accomplish. Uh, but before we get into the meat of the presentation, just to spend a couple of seconds to talk about the virtual outreach program that we have at uh, Emerson EMP Software. We're doing a number of virtual lecture series over the next uh, several weeks. Uh, please feel free to look through the different topics that are being uh, that are being presented over the next little while. I'm doing a, another couple, I think one on the 24th on geomechanics and another one on Fossimage in May, I believe. But we also have a number of other resources that are available to folks. Uh, like our clients can have access to our online university. There are a number of training videos there. And on our website, you can also access customer success stories. So please take some time to, to look through them and see what uh, resources we have available to you. Uh, I mentioned the virtual lecture series. Uh, if you go to uh, emerson.com EP, EP software, uh, you can get a list of what those, those different topics are. Uh, we've got one, I believe, on the uh, 14th is our next one. I'll talk more about that at the end of, uh, of my presentation. Okay, so this is the roadmap for today. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about the purpose, uh, why we were approached uh, to help and what we were trying to do for our, our clients. Uh, that will jump us into an overview of the workflow, uh, how we approached interpreting our offset well, and how we took that information from the offset well to look at the proposed well plans, the two different well paths. And then, you know, as, as much as, you know, I think we all love PowerPoint, sarcasm, uh, what I would like to really do then is actually jump into a demo and show you how we actually approach this within our software. So it's not death by PowerPoint. And then I'll wrap up um, and open the floor for questions. Okay. So one of the key challenges that our client had was trying to determine, you know, there, there, there were two well paths that were uh, proposed by the drilling engineers, and they wanted to figure out which of the two well paths was going to be the best in terms of initial original oil in place. The idea being if they could, if they could optimally place the well to begin with, they'd have more productivity on, uh, on the, at the beginning of the life cycle of the well, but then also hopefully over the entire lifespan of the well, they would get uh, more original, uh, more oil out of the well and more, more return on their uh, investment and maximize productivity. So what we wanted to do was integrate a petrophysical analysis, a geomechanical analysis, along with cluster analysis or electrophages analysis to help identify sweet spots within the zone of interest. And these sweet spots are going to be based off of, you know, a, off of the mineralogy and mechanical properties. Um, so we're going to take a look at how we actually went about that particular workflow. And then we'll talk a little bit more detail about how we then took the results from that and evaluated these two different well paths. So the, we had to start off with the offset well. So we had a near vertical well that we were, were looking at, and we had a, a good suite of logs for this particular well. And uh, we used an optimized petrophysical approach. Now, some of you may know that as, as probabilistic petrophysics or mineral inversion. But essentially, what we were trying to do was figure out what our mineralogy was of our well. So what, what are the mineral volumes? What are our fluid volumes? Uh, and one of the things that we get out of that is uh, an idea of our original oil in place. And we're going to take the results from that uh, optimized petrophysical approach and, and use them in a machine learning workflow or cluster analysis workflow to come up with a mineralogical phases. Okay. And then the next thing that we did was actually evaluate our, our well in terms of geomechanical properties. And specifically, we were looking at elastic rock properties and uh, also on confined compressive strength because I, I like looking at that one. Uh, but then we take, we take those properties and come up with a mechanical facies, again, using machine learning and cluster analysis. So we have these two different facies side by side, which is great. And we can get a lot out of those facies and, and looking at them individually. But what we really wanted to do was be able to, to evaluate, you know, what our what we would consider our sweet spot facies. And we wanted to do that in terms of, you know, which of those facies has the better original oil in place. 
So instead of evaluating the two different facies models individually, we decided to create a synthetic facies. So we basically combined the mineralogical facies and the mechanical facies to come up with a synthetic facies. And I'll show you that as part of the workflow when we get into the demo. And it is that synthetic facies that we evaluated for best original oil in place. Now, once we had all of that information, you know, the question was, how can we evaluate our horizontal well paths? So what we were gonna do, what we ended up doing is we had 3D surfaces that were provided to us by the geologist. So we can look at the well path in terms of those surfaces. We can also then take logs, be it wireline logs or our mineral and fluid volumes or electrophages logs and forward model those along our well path. And that's essentially what we, we ended up doing was forward modeling all of these different logs and evaluating which of the two well paths got us into our uh, sweet spot facies and stayed in it longer so that we had uh, could maximize productivity over the lifespan of the well. So that's that's the setup. Now, I told you I was gonna, wasn't going to kill you with PowerPoint, so I'm actually going to jump into a demonstration here. And let's see here. So I'm working within the Geolog application. And this is within Geolog, we have a tool called Well. And one of the things that I really like about Geolog is how customizable it is. And I'm going to show you some of that customization here in a second. But I want to start off with uh, this particular view because remember, what we're trying to figure out is which of our two proposed well paths is the one that we're going to choose to actually drill our well and go forward. So we've got this upper plan, which is called, it's the geosteer underscore plan well. Uh, we're working, this is a, an Eagleford play, and uh, we're looking at the lower Eagleford, and we happen to be in uh, Frio County. So I need to take a moment to thank Cytel. They're the ones who provided us the data, uh, and were kind enough to allow us to show the data as uh, for this particular story. And uh, so we've got you can see here I've got two well plans. This first well plan we come in and we we turn fairly early in the lower part of the Eagleford and we actually stay in about the middle Eagleford, Eagle, blah, try that again, the middle part of our lower Eagleford over the, the length of the well, okay? The second well plan, this geosteer underscore plan zero, you'll see we come in a little bit steeper, we turn a little bit later and we're staying closer to the base of the lower Eagleford. And we're staying pretty consistent across the, the length of the, of the horizontal well here. So, you know, which one of these is gonna be the best one in terms of our original oil in place? That's the question that we're trying to look at. Okay, so I mentioned that one of the things I really like about Geolog is, is how customizable it is. Um, so one of the things that I can do is create custom menus. And that's what I've done here. Um, I did that because I do this presentation uh, from time to time, but there can be a delay in the number of times that I actually do this presentation. And I, I, I'm pretty good at remembering what I did do, but having a guide to sort of step me through the workflow is really quite handy. So what I did was generate my own, uh, my own menu. So I populated this with the different steps that I'm going to take you through on this particular uh, uh, workflow here. So the other thing is, you can see I can actually move this or any of these other panels around. And the other ways that I can customize uh, my workflow is, is by uh, generating custom scripts and things of that sort as well. Um, so let's go ahead and take a look at the data that we're working with here. So we've got this offset well. This is where we're starting, if you recall. And you can see here, uh, I've got my Buddha, I've got a lower Eagleford, and I've got my, my upper Eagleford here. And it's this lower Eagleford that is our, our key zone of interest here. And you'll see I've already done a deterministic analysis. So I've got shale volume where we've got where you see uh, darker shades or green, uh, more green is where we have higher shale volume. I've got porosity and saturation calculated as well. But what I really wanted to do was evaluate this well in terms of optimized petrophysics so that I could output or calculate my mineral volumes and my fluid volumes. And the tool that we use for this for optimized petrophysics within Geolog is called Multimin. And the way optimized petrophysics works is you have a number of knowns, those are your logging tools, and you have a number of unknowns, those are your volumes. You have an idea of what your 
your mineralogy and your fluids are, but you don't know the quantity. So what we're ultimately going to solve is the quantity of our mineral and fluid volumes. And we do that by determining or specifying what logging tools we have access to. So here with this particular model, we're using density, neutron, uh, DT, shear velocity, and we're using spectral gamma ray here. So total gamma ray plus thorium potassium, and I'm using conductivity. In addition to that, if I had other logs that I wanted to bring in, I could easily do that. You'll see we can bring in NMR data. We can also bring in spectroscopy data, be it mineralogy or elemental data here as well. And as a petrophysicist, for me, my core data tends to be my ground truth. So if I had core data, I could actually incorporate that into my model as well. I don't have core data for this particular well, but that's okay. And you'll see here, we can also bring in uh, information from XRD and, and infrared as well. Okay, now for volumes, I happen to know, you know, a little bit. I know I have a general idea of what mineralogy I should find. Uh, so I'm gonna go with quartz and illite. We've got a heavy mineral that's usually zircon. We've got calcite, kerogen, and pyrite. And I also need to specify what my fluid volumes are. We're in the oil window, so I've got oil selected. I've got bound water and free water. So these are my unknowns. The equations are my knowns. Um, I can't have more unknowns than I have uh, known. So you know, if I need to have a, a broader number or more uh, minerals selected, then I would need to select more equations or more uh, wireline tools. So that's that's the gist of setting up the multi-min model. Now I could spend another hour going into more detail about multi-min, but I'm gonna leave that there. And what we're gonna do is actually uh, uh, run the model here. And you can see here, I'm gonna do this on a per interval basis. And you know, this is one particular model. Um, now, one thing you'll, you'll notice with this particular model under volumes, sorry, I've got quartz selected. Well, we know that the Buddha doesn't have uh, isn't going to really have much of a quartz content. So instead of running uh, this model with the Buddha, what I can do is select a model specific for, uh, for Buddha where I took out the quartz content. So instead of having a quartz volume, I have no quartz volume. So I can do different models over different intervals, which is quite nice. So I'm going to go ahead and run this guy. And we're going to take a look at the results once it's done. And here we go. So I'm going to hide the tracks where I don't have any data. And we're going to talk, we're going to take a little bit of time and talk through all of this. So on the left hand side, we've got the things that we are actually solving for. So you can see my mineral volumes on the far left track. You can see my different intervals. And then this, this uh, other track here, sort of three from the left, that's my uh, fluid volumes. Okay. And uh, you can see my I, the, some of the byproducts from this are saturation. You can see my uh, total and effective saturation. And, and this particular, the fluid volumes also gives us a, an idea of what our total porosity is, okay? So we're gonna come back and talk about the mineralogy and the fluid volumes. One of the other things I wanna talk about are, is one of the other byproducts that we get from this. Um, because of the way uh, probabilistic or optimized petrophysics works, one of the things you can output are predicted uh, logs. So here you'll see in black is my actual wireline gamma ray log. And then I've got this dotted line that represents my predicted gamma ray line. And you can see that for each of the other input logs here. And what you want to see is a good match between your wireline logs and the predicted logs. That tells you at least mathematically the model makes sense and is good. OK, and you'll see overall, I get a pretty good match. Things fall apart a little bit here with conductivities. There's there's likely something going on with with the with the clay content here. Uh, I'm not exactly sure. But overall, over the, the general zone of my well, I, I get pretty good matches. So I'm pretty happy with it from a uh, from a, a mathematical standpoint, at the very least. But what matters to me more than the math or as much as the math is whether or not the model actually makes sense. So I ran a model where uh, my, my, Buddha, my Buddha interval had, was a calcite-rich model. And you'll see we get a calcite-rich uh, volume for Buddha, which is what we'd expect. As we come into the lower Eagleford, we see an uptick in our illite. Okay? 
we see an uptick in our, our quartz volume, but we also see an increase in kerogen. That's this gray here that my mouse is hovering over. And the other thing that we see is an increase in our pyrite. Okay, and our pyrite volume stays pretty steady until about this 250 meter mark, and then it sort of decreases a little bit. Whereas our kerogen, we see a significant drop off in our kerogen at the boundary between our upper Eagleford and our lower Eagleford. And the other one that I want to draw your attention to is this U oil. This is our original oil in place. So this bright green that you see, that is our, that's the money. That's that's what we're chasing. Okay. All right. So with the mineralogical interpretation and the fluid volume interpretation done, I'm going to switch gears now and we're going to jump into the geomechanics. So now with the geomechanics, what I'm going to do is quite simple. I'm going to calculate, and I'm going to do this over the entire well here, I'm actually going to calculate uh, my elastic rock properties, so Poisson's ratio, Young's modulus, bulk moduli, P and S wave moduli. And I'm going to use a, an empirical relationship to output static versions of each of those as well. So I'll go ahead and run this guy. And then I'm also going to calculate unconfined compressive strength. Now, these are just two of the tools in the geomechanics workflow that we have within Geolog. You'll see we've got elastic rock properties, rock strength, stress magnitude, along with wellbore stability and cool on failure analysis. Now, I'm not going to go into details about those because there's another presentation that I'm giving, I believe, towards the end of this month where I'll actually go into more detail about our geomechanics workflow. But I'll go ahead and calculate unconfined compressive strength and we'll bring up the, the layout so we can take a look at the results. Now, this layout is built to look at the results from the full geomechanics workflow. So I'm just going to hide um, the tracks that are empty and I'm also going to just focus on the intervals that we're most interested in. And there's some things that should stand out right away to you if you're looking at this. First off, the unconfined compressive strength we see drops off when we go from the Buddha to the lower Eagleford, which we expect. This is a very calcite rich. We expect it to be fairly stiff. Um, the other thing we see is that our Young's modulus and our other three moduli also, we see a decrease as we come into the lower Eagleford. Okay. Um, one of the things that stands out to me with this is where we saw a pretty sharp contrast from the lower Eagleford into the upper Eagleford, we don't really see that with our elastic rock properties. You know, we see there's a little bit of an increase in our unconfined compressive strength, uh, but on our different moduli, we don't see much of a jump when we go to the low, from the lower Eagleford into the into this the first 10 meters or so, or the last 10 meters or so of the lower of the lower part of the upper Eagleford. So, from a mechanical standpoint or a geomechanical standpoint, this whole zone looks fairly similar. We have a number of tools for visualizing data, including ternary diagrams. So I, um, this particular ternary diagram with these different polygons here is one that comes with the software. You can modify and make your own polygons for these, which is really quite handy. And what I've done here is just plot up my clay versus quartz and calcite. And um, I'm color coding my data based off of my Young's modulus here. And things that jump out to me with this is, you know, as I increase my, as I decrease my clay content, I see my Young's modulus increase. And as I increase my calcite content, I see an increase in my Young's modulus. I don't think this is anything new, but it's, it's good to see confirmation in my, in my data. Okay, so now that I've done that, we're going to get into machine learning and electrophages analysis. And for me, this is one of the things that I get really passionate about. We have a tool called Fossimage that um, I could spend days talking about and days working with. Um, and one of the reasons why I really like Fossimage, I think, is that it, it really allows you to pull out and evaluate what's going on with your data. You can also, it does a really good job of, of working with raw data and, and really helping you visualize what's going on with, with that data. So cluster analysis and machine learning has been something that we've done for decades. And FOSSIMAJ is a tool that's been around for quite some time. It was developed in conjunction with uh, ELF and Total. And uh, you know, the, 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 it is a pretty powerful tool. So we're going to start off with building a mineralogical facies model, okay? And you'll see here I'm using my, my different volumes, my clay, quartz, calcite, pyrite, kerogen, my heavy mineral, and my U-oil and uh, U-watt. So I'm using both mineral and fluid volumes for this. Um, 
you can see here we've got a cross plot matrix which gives us an idea of the distribution of our data here um, one of the things that's really quite nice about this is these different uh, uh, cross plots actually pop out so I can look at them in uh, more detail and we'll talk a little bit about the clustering technique here so Anybody who's worked with me with Vossimage will know that I get very passionate about Vossimage, but I also get very, very passionate about MRGC or multi-resolution graph-based clustering. It's not our only clustering tool within uh, Geolog, but to me, it is probably one of the best, not just within Geolog, but I've had a number of clients tell me that in their mind, it's, it's one of the best in the industry. Um, one of the reasons for that is Unlike dynamic clustering, ascendant hierarchical clustering, or self-organizing map, with MRGC, you don't have to have a predetermined number of faces for it to find. So basically, you allow the data to speak for itself. So when we set this up, you can see here I have 12 different models. I have 30, a 35 facies model here. I've got a three facies model. So I didn't run this 12 times to come up with these different models. I ran MRGC once. And what I did was I told it, I want you to see if you can find one facies for a minimum number of facies. And I want you to see if you can find 35 facies for a maximum number of facies. And I want you to split that out over 35 different models. Okay. And when you run Multimin, when you run MRGC, it's going to come up with a neighboring index for all of the different points. And it's also going to come up with a, a, a KRI, which is a relative index of you know, uh, all of these different uh, values together. And it's the KRI that really tells uh, Fasimash how to break out these individual models. Okay. And so really, I'm letting the data drive the interpretation here. Instead of me saying, I think I have X number of facies, I'm letting it tell me if my, if, you know, maybe I do think I have 10 facies. Well, it couldn't really break out 10. It could break out nine and it could break out 11. OK, so that's one of the reasons why I'm a big fan of, of MRGC is it, it just does a really good job of letting the data speak for itself. So let's take a look at the model that we did actually go forward with, and it's this 14 cluster model. Now, if anybody's keen out there, you might see that there's a facies one and there's a facies three. Well, what happened was we actually took this 15 cluster model and duplicated it and we merged these two facies together. You see this weight of 20 and weight of 70 that are 50. That's the number of data points in that particular facies. And those are very similar. So we just merged them together here. So when I select on it, you can see I can split them out if I wanted to. So there's a couple of other things I want to draw your attention to. Facies this number one through three, you'll see we've got a higher calcite volume and that calcite volume drops out and these other facies. The other thing I want to draw your attention to is, you know, facies, the, the lower facies, so maybe say 12 through 14 here, we see an increase in our volume of keratin and we see an increase in our volume of original oil in place. Okay, so that's really interesting as well. So I'm going to actually take this particular model and I'm going to propagate it to our well. Okay, now I'm going to do the same thing for our geomechanical facies, except Obviously, instead of using mineral volumes, I'm going to use elastic rock properties. And in this instance, I'm using my four different moduli. OK, so here, you know, it's the same kind of thing. We can look at our different models that MRGC created. And again, I said, see if you can get down to as few as one and as many as 35 over 35 models. Well, it got down to two and it got up to 34 over 13 models. And it just so happens we have another 14 cluster model here. And this one, uh, you'll see we actually didn't merge anything. It's a genuine 14 cluster model here. And I'm gonna stick with that just so we have the same number of, of facies. It's just, I don't know, I like symmetry that way. And what I'll draw your attention to with this particular one is facies one through three or or even through four, we have a higher Young's modulus. What you'll see over the course of these facies is a, is a decrease in our Young's modulus value. So these upper values where we've got the blue facies um, have a higher Young's modulus. It suggests stiffer material. These lower facies have a, 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 or the higher facies numbers like 12 through 14 have a, a, a lower Young's modulus, which suggests the material's not quite as stiff. So we're gonna take that particular guy and propagate it out across our wells, and we're going to take a look at the results. OK, so here's our mineral interpretation from the Multimin 
uh, optimized petrophysical analysis. Here are different moduli. And here we've got the mineral facies on the, uh, to, the, to the right of my elastic rock properties. And we've got my geomechanical facies to the right of that. And what you'll notice is when we go from the Buddha into the lower eagle fur, there's a very distinct change. And in, in both instances, we've got blue facies that are indicative of my Buddha. For my mineral facies, we have those warmer facies that are indicative of the higher keratin and the higher original oil in place. And you'll see that drops off pretty sharply at this lower eagle fur boundary. But the mechanical facies here, you'll see, you know, we've got these warmer facies indicating lower Young's modulus. And we see that going into the lower part of the upper eagle for here. And, and it really doesn't drop off until above this 250 marker. Okay. So I can evaluate these side by side and I can draw a lot of conclusions from these side by side. But one of the things that we were really intrigued about was what happened if we combined them? Because remember what we're really trying to get at is can we, we, can we pinpoint a sweet spot facies that has perhaps better original oil in place? So instead of trying to evaluate these side by side, what we did was generated a synthetic facies. And we did that by combining the geomechanical facies and the mineral facies into one Fossimage model. And you'll see here again, you know, we tried to say, can you find one facies? Can you find 35 over 35 models? Well, the best it could do was 26 facies. Okay. Um, so we're going to take this particular model this 26 facies model and we'll propagate it out to our offset well and now we'll take a look at our final results of all uh, of our uh, synthetic facies we'll look at everything together here okay and what you'll see is the synthetic facies again we have a sharp contrast between the lower eagle for the buddha which we'd expect because we see that in each of the other two facies but what we also see is that we have a fairly sharp contrast going from the lower Eagleford into the upper Eagleford, okay? Um, the, we see these green facies in, uh, that are sort of dominant in this, the Eagleford, but these warmer color facies, and this, this facies in particular, I'm giving away the punchline, um, you know, are more indicative of the lower Eagleford. So remember, we're trying to evaluate our, our are uh, two different well paths. And so how are we really gonna do that? Well, we will also need to look at our offset well and evaluate you know, which of, the, of these different facies, of the synthetic facies, what I call a mineral mechanical facies, which of those facies uh, gives us uh, better results with regards to original oil in place. And we can do that by looking at a histogram that's uh, set up as a box plot. Okay, so I'm looking at my, my original oil in place, my mineralogy.view uh, ball view oil, and I'm setting it up as a box plot using that synthetic facies to break, to break things out. And if we look at our zone of interest, which is the lower Eagleford in our offset well, we have a mean value of almost, well, let's say 6.7% original oil in place in our mean well. But what should stand out to you beyond what the mean original oil in place is over the lower Eagleford is that this facies 19, we go down to a value of about 3%, but we also go up to almost 19%, right? With a mean value sitting at about 10. So with regards to original oil in place, it's this facies 19 that really kind of stands out. So how can we look at this and how can we compare this to our uh, offset wells? Well, Originally, the work was done with our GeoSteer tool, but we have this uh, functionality called offset model, which will allow us to forward model data from our offset well to our different planned wells. Okay, and there's not a whole lot to see, but what I will show you is what logs that we actually forward modeled. And for the GeoSteer plan well, that's the one that sort of sits in the middle of the lower Eagleford. We moved a whole, we basically forward modeled all of our electrophases logs, our wireline logs, our geomechanical logs. For the plan zero well, we realized we didn't need to forward model all of those, however, we could have, but we did forward model our electrophases log, logs as well as our original oil in place and our wireline logs. So by doing that, it allows us to then, you know, I'm going to close this guy, it allows us to do the same kind of forward looking using this histogram view. Um, so if I bring up original oil in place and go to plan here and I'm going to split my screen so we can see these side by side. 
Okay, so this is the geosteer plan well. This is the well that goes in, that sits at about the middle of the Eagle, uh, lower Eagleford. And you can see here, again, our facies 19 is the, is the standout, but our mean value is only about 7.2% with this guy, with, uh, with this guy sitting around anywhere from, let's say seven and a half up to maybe 11%, okay? So what happens if we look at the, the other well? So I'm gonna move this guy over to here so we can do this side by side. And I'm gonna bring up another one of these guys and I'm gonna to point to the well, the proposed well path where we come in and we sit along the base of the, the lower Eagleford. And what you'll notice, there's, a, there's a, a couple of things that really stand out. Number one, we see a, num a lot more facies through uh, the course of that well path. But the other thing that stands out, the mean value, this jumps out at me, we go from a mean of, uh, 7% up to a mean of almost 17%, that's pretty significant. The other side of it is, you know, this facies 19, which is our sweet spot facies, we're going from, you know, about 10% to just over 20% with the mean sitting around maybe 18, close to 19, okay? So this is what really stands out for me, is the fact that, you know, this particular well path, and if we look at this guy, so we can project those electrophages Ford model those electrophases logs along our proposed well path, uh, well paths, and we can see the plan zero well path. We actually get into that facies 19, it's this really bright green, and we basically stay in it for the length of the, of, of the rest of the well. Um, we do encounter more facies in the upper part as we approach the heel, uh, but we, in, in the plan well, you can see we hit that sweet spot facies, but we bounce around a bit. And so that reduces, potentially reduces our initial original oil in place. So with these results, we went to our client and we're like, hey, I think you should go with the plan zero well where you stay near the base of the, the lower Eagleford. Now, I would love to tell you that I could wrap this up and they they actually went to drill this well, but they divested the, the uh, property and I don't actually know if they, they uh, went with this and drilled the well and, and so I can't tell you, but what I can tell you is, is just looking at the difference between these two frequency views. I still stand by the work that we did to say that that lower well path is probably the best well path to move forward with. So with that, I'm going to uh, come back to the PowerPoint presentation here. And hopefully what I've shown you over the last 30 minutes or so is how you can integrate, you know, a petrophysical evaluation with geomechanics and uh, use all of that information with a machine learning analysis to get more out of your data. The work I did was, was very much focused on an unconventional play, but there's no reason you couldn't do something similar with a conventional workflow. Um, you know, so you can use this to help evaluate potential well plans to help determine which of them might be the best in terms of initial well placement and hopefully help you sort of uh, maximize your uh, original oil in place and ultimately the, the productivity over the lifespan of your well.